Kevin Blackstone and introducing Kimberly A. Martin. First career show. Welcome. <laughs> that girl is on fire. Today, Baker Mayfield, the latest Cleveland Brown to test positive. Is the NFL barreling towards a postponement in the middle of a playoff race? And how Deion Sanders flipped the number one recruit in the country from his alma mater to Jackson State. Let's go around the horn. Ah, what a tie. What a tie. Game to Mariah Tony from Chargers Chiefs. Kimberly A. Martin Hales from Brooklyn. Well, that's going to get you points on this show to start. Syracuse <laughs> Proud. You've seen her on the field and in studio for Sunday NFL Countdown, NFL Live, Sports Center. She's covered the Jets and the Washington football team. Her podcast, First Take Her Take, is fire. Kimberly. Tell us your life story. You've got seven seconds. Go ahead. Uh, from Brooklyn, you said it. So I talk with my hands. I've covered a lot of bad football, and all these guys need to know is I make a lot of faces. I'm a walking me, so watch <laughs> out, boy. All right, you know how this show works, Kimberly? Nobody does. Your first mute button. Let's go around the horn. <laughs> What just happened to college football? Uh, this, this is game-changing, landscape-changing, a brave new world. Whether this is about name, image, and likeness, or a cult of personality, Hall of Famer like Deion Sanders recruiting, but here it is, the news of the day. Travis Hunter, defensive back, number one recruit in America. He had verbally committed to Florida State, announcing today after a few fake caps. Not Florida State, not Georgia, but Jackson State. Israel, what just happened? What did Deion Sanders just do? I mean, it's a great move for college football. It's a great move for student athletes. What just happened is this college football or athletics program, program with about $8 million of budget just pulled a student athlete away from a Florida state that has, what, nine figures in terms of an athletic budget. And the best part about it is was his statement when he talked about the meaning of HBCUs, or he talked about what it meant to him to start something. And, you know, when you're 18, 17 years old and you're talking about making a lasting impact for years to come over on something that really matters to you like that's separate from football and now that's something that student athletes can really take into account because you know people complain about oh if you've seen it tweeted now you can pay an athlete to go to whatever school you want them to go to and maybe they're referring to obviously nil but come on wasn't that happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. all the time where these bigger programs are finding ways to pay these student athletes so now you can do it above board and for better reasons than just hey hoarding all the top talent in the country just in a few areas i think it was a great great day and a great decision for college football right now evan black is still number one recruit in the country leaving florida state or, or decommitting or just not going there jumping to an hbcu in jackson state what just happened well, what just happened is Deion Sanders proved once again what a great salesperson he is. And we also know, as, as uh, Izzy just alluded to, that NIL may have something to do with this because, remember, Deion Sanders is a content producer for Barstool Sports, mm -hmm. as, as nauseating it is for me to say that. Um, and certainly that means he could probably cut a deal if he hasn't already um, for, for Hunter to, to, to get in on those goods too. But before we celebrate NIL too much, I just want to remind people that even though athletes now are able to cash in on their celebrity while they're playing college ball, they are still not able to cash in on the labor that they produce for those, college, uh, those colleges at which they bring in all those revenues. That, that's not money that's going in their pocket. This is basically getting an opportunity to go outside of your, outside of your college and make money on your own um, if, in fact, you, you're able to do that. So good for him, good for JSU, and good for Well, let me, let me ask you a follow-up real quick, Kevin. Do, do you see this more as a one-off then? You had a, you had a special player. Who, he's a cornerback, and he's going to the greatest cornerback of all time. So exactly. th there's that. The barstool angle, which you could say what you want. They're making money. They're printing money. Right. And do you see this as a one-off, or do you see this as a game-changer? No, I see it as a one-off. I mean, we continue to talk about this the last couple of years now when top recruits who are black have gone to HBCUs rather than go to a, uh, a, a PWI. Um, so until there's a huge 
paradigm shift, I'm going to still say that this is right now a one-off. Kimberly Martin, how do you view it? Travis Hunter going to Jackson State. Listen, Dion said he was going to change the game. And he did with this recruit. Like, think about why HBCUs were even created in the first place. Because we weren't, people that looked like me could not go to PWIs. I, I went to two PWIs. I have two degrees. But watching that video, that's the ultimate hype video. Like, Dion just needs to keep rolling it out on Twitter. That, for all these HBCUs, that's what it can be. The way those kids were so hyped to watch him to celebrate that moment. That was huge. For me, as a woman of color watching that, I thought this could be a watershed moment because it's football. We've seen McCourt Maker make this decision in basketball, but football is a different breed. And if we can get more guys doing that, the game could change. Really. Follow up for you, though. McCourt Maker mm -hmm. didn't make it through a month at Howard uh, on the basketball court. He's now playing in Australia and he's averaging five points a game. Was that the right decision for him? Was it the right decision? I mean, I can't, I can't say that for that kid. That's, what he, that's a decision he made. But there could be more guys that look at him and say, you know what, I could actually have success at a Howard. I could have success at a Jackson State, uh, you know, an, another HBCU. We don't have to say we just need to go to a Duke or we just need to go to a Clemson. Maybe the tide does turn. Maybe Ke Kevin, he's, he doesn't think this could be it, but maybe it could. We don't know. Let's hope it I'm is. Bill yeah, I think at the end of a couple of weeks of debate about are college football coaches worth it, the answer is unequivocally yes. This is about Coach Prime. Well worth it. He, mm. he's, he, he's recruited four top 30 ESPN recruits in the last two top years. Top 300. There's power five, there's top 300. There's power five schools. 21 of them haven't, haven't, haven't recruited that many. So he's out recruiting them. They're drawing 42000 a game there. National spotlight's on there. This kid's not going there unless he can make money in college, which he can, unless he can get to the pros, which he can, unless he can be a top draft pick, which he can. And Coach Prime made all this happen. And this is, this is I, 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 I agree with Kimberly, this is a watershed moment. They get the good coaches in there, this can happen. Kevin Black is done after the horn. Well, one thing NIL has, has provided an opportunity to do is go wherever you can and sell your celebrity and be able to make some cheddar. And that's what JSU is, is uh, cashing in on here. And making the NFL still in play for him from Jackson State. We've seen how many Absolutely. Hall of Famers have an HBCU from background. HBCUs, of course. Absolutely. But he's not going up against oh. maybe the wide receivers he'll see in the NFL. That's not a concern for you, Blake. He can do that on pro day. He can do that in, in, in training camp, right? Jackson State, by the way, 11-1 and this year with Deion Sanders. I mean, it wasn't just I'll bring in recruits. I'll be – wasn't chance. Deion Sanders, wouldn't you really call him the first NIL guy ever? Really, the way he was going about his business when he was at Florida State? And that's right. an incredible wrinkle here. That he took him from Florida State is all more matter. Oh, oh, juicy. We'll move on to the inevitability now that COVID is going to affect the NFL playoff race. News of the day from Cleveland. The outbreak growing. Kim, you were reporting today while your fellow panelists were twiddling their thumbs on their Twitter timeline uh, that Baker Mayfield tested positive. Brown's roster looking more like it'll be decimated going into Saturday's game with Vegas a win they need. And it's playing out elsewhere, too. L.A. Rams facility remains closed. Washington in the throes of it as well. While the NBA and NHL go through postponements and positive tests, the NFL's numbers skyrocketing. More positives in the last two days than the last two weeks. Kimberly, you're covering... This Browns Raiders game for this network. Once again, guys, what are you doing here? Um, oh, yes. So what does the NFL have on its hands with the latest outbreaks? And can you see a situation where this game could be postponed Saturday? Look, Tony, the NFL has a huge wake-up call on its hands. That's what it's dealing with. Because last year, we had this season. Games were postponed but not canceled. No vaccine. Coming into this year, the NFL was very strict about, hey, we want guys to be vaccinated because you know what? They're not losing out on any money. I don't know if anybody realizes this, but the NFL is not trying to cancel any games and lose any money. So basically, I don't see, I don't foresee a situation where any of these games are forfeited, canceled, because that's the, that's the last thing the NFL wants to do. If anything, I think the NFL should go back to some of the protocols that I had last year, daily testing. Maybe, you know, practices are spread out. Guys, don't eat lunch together. You just grab and go. Because this is the worst case scenario. This week, this false sense of security, now it's right in the NFL's face and they have to do something so about it. So you, you believe no chance that there would be a postponement 
or no chance that there would be a forfeiture. Uh, let me ask you one follow-up here. Any chance the NFL modifies its, its protocol here to allow for asymptomatic players to get back on the field sooner? There's talk of that at the, at the league meeting in Dallas, but I think the NFL PA is really pushing for, for the NFL to go back to some of the old protocols. And I think the NFL has to do that because this week, it's not just Cleveland. We're seeing a cluster in Washington. The Rams are dealing with stuff out in LA. There are at least six or seven teams right now that are dealing with outbreaks within their own facility. Something has to change, especially because we're getting to the playoffs. Lasky. Yeah, Kimberly, you said that this was a wake-up call. The wake-up call was Monday night. The Rams took the field with missing some of their best offensive players and Jalen Ramsey at the last minute missing them. And guess what? The Rams won the game. The Rams showed if you have depth, if you have you know, c- commitment, you can win these games. I think life goes on. I don't think the NFL does anything. I don't think they postpone. I don't think they cancel. I don't think they push back. I think they think every team needs to be prepared for this. They should be prepared for this. And the Rams showed you can win with this. And I think teams, teams will do Israel, that. you'll remember the game last year where the Broncos started a wide receiver at quarterback. That clearly was not the best NFL game of the year. Do you believe the league has to look into changing their protocol here? I believe, you know, testing of vaccinated players more often should be the case. I believe we should get a grasp of obviously who is carrying the virus. But I do, I understand sort of the frustration of vaccinated players, boosted players who still test positive and are asymptomatic and still have to suffer the same fate that maybe an unvaccinated player or basically because we are protected, essentially protecting the unvaccinated in this situation. So it is frustrating when you've got a group of vaccinated players who are asymptomatic sitting at home saying, I'll probably be you know, negative in two days, but I've got to follow all of these things and my team's issues are, at, and my team's season is at stake here. So I understand all that. So maybe the league can look at, as we talked about, softening some of the requirements for vaccinated players who are asymptomatic. But for the time being, we all just have to have perspective still that, A, we're in, yes, year two of this, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. We are learning as we go. So maybe things will be different next year than this year. But right now, we've got to play. And Kevin Blackestall. Well, I just think that the league needs to react just like much of society is, right? Uh, We have um, cities, municipalities um, where they are floating different protocols depending on the way the COVID rates are are, are going, right? Sometimes you have to wear a mask indoors. Sometimes maybe you you don't, depending on what the numbers are. And I think that's where the NFL is right now. I'll I'll say this, though, um, and I'm going to an NFL game this weekend in Philadelphia where 17 members of the Washington football team may not be there because they have tested positive for COVID because of one player, possibly, Montez Sweat, who is apparently unvaccinated, expressed um, a great concern about that and so I'm wondering if you're building a team should you not think about the vaccination status of somebody you may, may want to sign would it affect the playoff race was a question many had asked well we're in it right now Cleveland was a touchdown favorite over the Raiders going into this week they're now an underdog Washington in that same boat as well in the hunts but playing with a decimated roster we'll be back by or sell and Steph Curry's three-point record to you from the Seaport District at Pier 17. Out Steph Curry broke the three-point record gradually, assuredly, and explosively last night at Madison Square Garden. I could hang a Kirk Goldsbury graphic on my wall. I think these are so beautiful. I could watch Spike Lee sneak into the background and take perspective shots all day. Mean? Listen, I'm not going to question one of the greatest auteurs and filmmakers ever, but is he going for butt shots here? What is he doing? You can see how much this meant to Curry. He said afterwards he wouldn't call himself the greatest shooter ever until he got this record. And he also said he wants to put it out of reach, untouchable for anybody else. But, Bill, we've been talking a week about this record. It feels like it's grown in importance every day. Some people didn't even know it existed last week, and now it was an event, an all-time moment last night. Do you now see this as one of the most important records in sports? Yes, absolutely I do. And I was there for a lot of the home run record breaking. This felt like that. Really? Because Steph Curry is is Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth created the home run. Steph Curry, he created the three-point shot. He basically created it, he popularized it, he made it, and he's so far ahead of anyone else. He's more than more than five and more than five and a half seasons, six six and a half seasons, seasons fewer than Ray Allen did. Yes, this is monumental, monumental feat. Do you think it'll be untouchable in the end when, when he's done, Bill? Nobody's gonna catch him. Nobody's gonna catch him. 
All right, Israel, now to you. Is this the home run record for you? Yeah. Well, this is exactly where I landed on it. This record is what it is. And this is for those who say it's disrespectful of Steph Curry to talk about the record as unimportant. This record is what it is because Steph Curry is the one breaking it, because we love watching him play, because he brings so much joy, because we know he's going to set that mark at a potentially untouchable number, and because we know doing it at this early in his career, 33 years old with so much space left, even though the game has changed and he has done his part to change it, is still remarkable. Even just him in, in pregame and layups, when he does that sky-high layup and then chest bumps everybody, that's joyful stuff and people want to be around it. So I think he's the reason this this record means. KB, did you know this record last week before Steph, you know, he said, I'm going to get 16 and break it. Did you know it last week? Um, yeah, I kind of knew it. They've been talking about this being a possible record going into the season. I've been paying attention to that. Um, and this is kind of like basketball's home run. You can argue that. It's only been in the NBA since 1979. Um, but I will suggest this. With the exponential um, rise in the number of three-pointers taken, the accuracy of the people shooting it, the rate that they are shooting it at, that this record will fall at some point. Because you can just look around the country now, whether it's high school, college, everybody. You're going the other way. Okay. Everybody, oh, yeah, everybody's shooting three-pointers. This is a record that will be and broken Kimberly? at some point. The, the fact, are we really talking about is this important? I mean, did you see Spike? Did you see the angles of those Yeah, pictures? I know, but Spike, I mean. Spike, everybody <laughs> in it. That's the whole point because it's such a big deal. And uh, to Kevin's point, maybe Trey Young breaks it. Or maybe it's some guy we've never heard of. But for this moment, New York City, I'm a Brooklyn kid. So th the Garden, we recognize greatness. Yes, you recognize greatness for opposing applaud. players. That's what you recognize greatness for, Kimberly. That Spike <laughs> Lee got excited. That's what he does. He gets excited at other people. Clash, do you think this is as big as the home run record? Do you know what the number is right now? Do you know, you know what the record was? Do you, do you even know the number? For what? Three, three, For what? Three, exactly. Three, <laughs> we're, we're moving on. Nets 131, Raptors 149. This game was bonkers. It went to overtime. Nets were missing seven to COVID. They played four rookies, and Kevin Durant, who was questionable with an ankle to begin with, had a huge triple-double. My, my question, Israel, is he's now averaging his most minutes per game in seven years after he put 48 on the floor to get this win yesterday. Are the Nets asking too much of Durant too early? I don't think so. I think he is just out there hooping, and he will tell you if he's tired, and his performance will tell you that he's not tired. He got a day off uh, last week in Houston, that game that James Harden came back. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't think they're asking too much. He would tell you. if KB? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, this is what he does. He's a baller. Look, you're missing half of your team. You're the superstar on the team. This is why we pay you all the bucks. Can you go and carry us to a, to a victory? Sure, no problem. I got this after I dropped a 51 piece just the other day. Martin. <laughs> Uh, of course not. I mean, this is the season hasn't even really started. Like, when we get closer to this end of the season, we might need him to actually play more with Kyrie. What's he doing? This is what you want from your stars. You need to put the team on your back and play until your feet break. Well, yes. uh, he's had, it was an Achilles. Uh, Bill Plaschke, the most minutes he's had in seven years? Yeah, I'm so impressed with him. I mean, in some ways, this was the most impressive NBA feat last night. He's got four rookies around him, eight players, <laughs> a sore ankle. He goes 48 minutes, triple, double, doesn't complain. And afterward, ask about Kyrie Irving. He could have thrown him under the bus. His teammate should have been there. Didn't rip him either. Handled it with class. I thought it was a big moment for Durant. You've already flip-flopped. You said Curry. You said it was the home run record. No, it was no, the most was important thing. Run, and then one was, question was later. This is <laughs> What, what record? <laughs> All right. Thanks for today, Bill. Israel as well. Ooh, the rookie makes it through. But she's got the professor. Kevin Blackestone, Kimberly A. Martin. Showdown, two minutes. Uh.